Um, I was born in Kashmir in 1936, uh, um, and I led a idyllic childhood, uh, mostly in Kashmir, when my father was working as a hydroelectricity um, man, uh, and uh, he was extremely busy. My mother was a, a king's nurse and had gone out there and met him out there, and um, we led the most beautiful life up in Kashmir, at living at 5,000 feet um, through the winter, going up to 9,000 feet through the summer. It was an idyllic childhood, uh, well away from the war. But the only thing that spoiled the whole thing was that my father died suddenly in 1941. And my mother had to <clears throat> start working again. And um, then at partition in 1945, of course, we were sent home to England and uh, arrived in the Cotswolds in Sirencester to live with her family as we had no home and no means of support. I was horrified. I was horrified. The journey was awful on a troop ship. Um, I was absolutely thrown into this awful country, which was grey, 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 grey. People's clothes were grey, their eyes were grey, the sky was grey, the houses were grey, and <clears throat> they were in a frightful state after the war. Rationing, the food was grey, everything was grey. And to my horror, I was sent down to a prep school um, by the sea, which was grey. <laughs> and our uniform was grey. <laughs> and the food was appalling. It was so cold. I've never been so cold in my life. Although we lived at 9,000 feet some of the time, and we were in deep, deep snow, the cold wasn't the same. There was no dampness. And I felt miserable. And I got thinner and thinner and thinner. And I felt extremely ill. And one day, I was having a bath, and Matron walked in, and she said, Anne Walton, what are you doing, drinking the bath water? I was lying in my bath, just drinking the water. I said, I can't stop being thirsty. I'm thirsty the whole time. And she said, right, you must see the doctor tomorrow. She was marvellous. She was as quick as that. Well, I saw the doctor tomorrow, and two days later, my mother turned up and said, I've got to take you to London. She took me back to her old hospital, King's College Hospital. It was extremely lucky for me because in those days it was the leading hospital on diabetic control. The man who rarely um, got this going was a Dr. Lawrence. And he had started a diabetic clinic there and not only that, a diabetic wing where, which wasn't just one ward, it was several wards, and the whole thing was beautifully, beautifully set up. I was horrified, though, being landing in this great, enormous hospital and um, being told, and all these tests going on, and being told suddenly, out of the blue, that I'd have to inject myself for the rest of my life. I'd never had an injection in my life had no childhood diseases and nothing wrong with me at all. Well, I'm afraid I wasn't at all brave, but it, this had to be done and I immediately started feeling better. They were very, very strict in those days. I was taught from the beginning. In fact, I was made to go into a hypo and feel what it was like to be hypo because um, my mother always used to call it, are you feeling giddy, dear? And I said, yes, I am. And this was when your blood sugar fell down rapidly and you needed to be given glucose. And I thought this was a wonderful thing to do, to teach me what it was like to feel like that. And that has been a wonderful help to me all my life, to be able to recognize those symptoms when they start very early. And only once during my life have I been completely out with a hypo. 
And in those days, the worst thing was the... Well, the syringes were glass, the needles were thick, and they were resharpened. And you used to have to choose your needle for the day or for that injection, and you'd rush over to the trolley and try and find the thinnest one, which you had to push into you. Well, I screamed like Billio for about an hour till I'd do it. And it was very, very painful. And I wasn't at all good about it. And um, the other thing was, the other frightful thing in those days, which seemed to be so degrading, you had to, your urine had to be tested, um, collected and tested in um, by, well, I couldn't do it by my mother, in a test tube over a Bunsen burner. Now, this is extremely difficult and embarrassing um, to uh, control. I mean, if it boiled over, it would go shooting right across the room. So if ever you were staying with terribly fussy people, they used to get very annoyed with me, having diabetes and upsetting their beautiful furniture and rooms and things. And so I, I felt rather a leper, really. And no one understood diabetes very much in those days. Uh, I think um, the only bonus was, which was a tremendous bonus, we had ration books. And diabetics were given three ration books. So all my friends' mothers used to say, do you think you could have Anne to stay this holidays? Because they used to gather up my three ration books <laughs> <laughs> and enjoy all the extra cheese, butter, meat, and uh, but not sugar, of course. We were allowed to have the sugar for preserving, because in case we went hyper, we were allowed to eat a, a spoonful of jam or something sweet. So, um, in in that respect, I was a, quite nice to have around. But in most other respects. I was, felt I was a great nuisance. The school wouldn't let me eat with the other children because I had to have a special diet. I had to take sandwiches down into the, into the playing fields to eat my own lunch. I had to weigh my potatoes on little scales. My bread had to be cut um, against a metal thing at a special size. And it all had to be done out exactly. Well, this didn't work. So um, it was pretty dif difficult for me. So my mother did a wonderful thing. She came and she found a school that would take her a sister and, and educate me. And for the first, I suppose this was until I was about 13, she stayed with, with me at that school and got me thoroughly used to being totally independent, doing my injections, coping with meals, they were very sympathetic in this school. And I managed to get strong. I was about two years, I should say, physically behind the other girls. Um, but uh, slowly I developed. And she suddenly said to me, now I'm going to leave you behind here. You're to cope on your own from about the age of 13 or 14 because you've got to cope in the future on your own. And I think this is the best way of doing this. I'll just, so I'll just ask you to recap on the ages then. I am recapping now on when I became diabetic. Um, I was diagnosed um, when I was still nine. And my mother supervised me very carefully through um, my schooling until um, through the prep school and also um, for my first two years at the next school until I was 12 or 13. And when she decided that I had to become independent. And now this was an... I was horrified, but it was an extremely useful thing for me because it made me, from that moment on, realize that I had to look after myself. And I couldn't blame anyone else if things went wrong. Only me.
because no one else would understand it as well, understand me as well as I did. How I was feeling, what I needed to eat, if I was going hypo, or if I was becoming sugary. Although in those days it was extremely difficult to control it by having no easy blood tests as there are these days. It was an ex it was a matter of hit and miss, really. Um, you had a blood sugar done perhaps three times a year when you um, went to the clinic. My mother always took me to King's College Hospital because they were such a leading light in, in all this. And they would regulate my insulin, say put it up one unit here or one unit there. From the beginning, I was on one injection daily, a mixed dose of soluble and protopin zinc. And then when I was round about 13, um, they decided I should have two injections daily, two mixed doses, which I did. And this kept me under excellent balance. And um, I really had no bad hypos. I did everything at school. I was determined, although I'd started out being very, very thin, I got stronger and stronger. And I kept up with um, all the games and ended up in, in all the teams in the end. And I think all this exercise I had, which was quite difficult to regulate, because, um, you know, in the middle of a tennis match, um, with all the school cheering you and so on, you suddenly go hypo. You, ha you know, I found I was very useful. My mother used to make little bags with glucose tablets and pin them inside my pockets. So I could always reach inside my pocket and eat a glucose tablet if I felt my blood sugar sinking. And never once did I have to be helped over that. And it was such a very practical thing that I can, you know, just always thank her for doing that. And, of course, uh, with regular meals at school, and I could always get my injection at the right time, and I never forgot it, and I didn't try to mess around with it at all. So I really had a very healthy um, school childhood and school days. How did your fellow pupils react? They were pretty good at this school. Um, they were fairly understanding. They didn't know anything about it. No one really knew the disease in those days. I did have to take my little scales into meals, which I found quite um, quite embarrassing. I found it more embarrassing as I got older, because by the time I was in the sixth form, and you know, having to sort of have all these younger ones watching me, <laughs> they all wondered what on earth I was doing, why I had to do this, and it was rather quite difficult explaining it. So, in a way, you're the younger you are, the easier it is. And I think this goes really for, for diabetes because if you get it when you're young, you just accept it. You never feel sorry for yourself. It's just one of those things. You hate giving yourself the injections at the beginning. And in those days, they rarely hurt. So that wasn't good. So in that way, I suppose I was quite sorry for myself. But in fact, I used to keep myself awake at night so that I wouldn't have to wake up in the morning and give myself an injection. Um, but then you get used to it. And How did the teachers react? The teachers were very, very sympathetic and very good and treated me like the other children. And if ever I felt extremely tired, uh, I knew I could go uh, uh, along and say, could I have the afternoon off and have a sleep? Because I did feel get tireder than other, other children. So around uh, about once a week or once a fortnight, I'd have the afternoon off and go and sleep it off and feel better. But I, I did get stronger and stronger. And by the end of my school days, I really didn't feel I was any different to anyone else. And this was largely due to the very, very good training. I knew exactly what to eat. I was brought up on a strict regime of, um, 
of carbohydrate counting. I had 160 grams of carbohydrate a day, um, 40 for breakfast, 10 for mid-morning, 40 for lunch, 20 for tea, 40 for supper, and 10 last thing at night. And I never wavered from this, and everything went swimmingly. This was quite easy at school. The problem started, I think, rarely, when I left school and I was on my own and I had a gap here where I had to earn my own living. So I looked after children, so I was thrown into different families and had to eat what they ate. I had to do a lot of guessing. I managed it, I didn't get ill. I even went to France looking after children. And that was quite jolly because I didn't think I'd even had a glass of wine in my life. And I didn't know how much glass of how much sugar there was in a glass of wine. Anyway, through trial and error I managed to get through those few months and then went to Oxford and was a student for three years. And that I think was possibly the hardest time of my life. Okay. From 1954 to 1957, um, I attended Dorset House School of Occupational Therapy and went through three and a quarter years of a year's hospital practice and the rest of the time in, in Oxford as a student, uh, which was very interesting. One had to be totally responsible for myself again. Um, from school days, it was this was vastly different. Also very short of money, I had a pound a week to live on. And so broken biscuits and Marianne margarine were the thing, which doesn't go down very well for, for diabetics, but still, never mind. I think I only ended up in the Radcliffe once with a nasty boil. Um, but my um, fellow students were extremely good. Uh, socially, um, of course, um, one had a whale of a time, and this too um, had its problems. As you can imagine, being, um, being a student and having to um, somehow fit in an, in an injection when you go out in the evening, when you never know what's going to happen, all right, if it was a formal dance or something like that, then you you you, you go to a May ball, dance a night away, and expend an awful lot of energy. So then you had to be careful that you were actually taking in enough sugar, um, not too much, not too little, and not too much alcohol, because of course that sends you, you into a hypo extremely quickly which I didn't know in those days. Now, this was something, I don't know if it's just only recently known, but I certainly didn't know about that. We didn't drink a lot. No one had any money to do it, mainly, mainly cider, which, of course, was rather sweet. Anyway, um, I did find that it was an eye-opener when I started working uh, in hospitals, responsible for patients. I couldn't afford to go hypo and especially working with children and mental patients. With other patients, one could always explain if you're feeling a bit strange and you needed a sweet drink. But with uh, when I had a, um, a job in the children's hospital eventually in Bristol, um, I did find this, I did have to keep on the high sugar side rather than risk going hypo and letting the children down and not being able to look after them because this would have been disastrous and I'd have lost my job. Um, driving, I learnt to drive during this time, which was no problem because um, I never had um, unexpected hypos um, and uh, I never had any problems. My eyesight was excellent. I had no complications at all during the whole of this time. So um, 
Why did you describe this period at Dorset House then as the most difficult time? Well, it's most difficult because you are m more than ever entirely on your own. You're not attached to a family, so nothing's regular, nothing at all. Your meals are, are all over the place, apart from lectures. And then you'd always have to find your own, own food, buy your own food, um, plan it, and if you're in, in a flat, to make it. The first six months in a hostel, that was easier. So that was a good breaking in time. Um, but I had had this extremely good experience of having a mother who um, made me independent. I would say from, rarely from 13 or 14, I think that's quite late enough to be made independent uh, and to be responsible for your own intake of food and um, making sure you have your injections at the right time and not forgetting them. Um, she was a rather amazing woman because it must have been extremely worrying for her, leaving me alone in this boarding school and then eventually uh, letting me go to France for a few months on my own with um, um, a lot of insulin, a lot of extra needles and so on. Um, and in fact, at one stage, she, she flew out to France to bring me over some more insulin so that I'd have the right kind. Um, I wrote to her and said I thought I was running out. She was really excellent to do this for me. And another very scary time she had was when, at the end of my training, I'd just taken finals, got on my um, Lambretta with another friend, and four of us, four girls, we drove down to Spain on our Lam Lambrettas over the Pyrenees. And I put one syringe on one Lambretta and one syringe on the other, and off we went. My mother didn't say a word. She said, as long as you send me a postcard, dear, every four or five days, it'd be quite useful. Well, she got one, I think, twice. <laughs> she still didn't worry. <laughs> and so she was a very remarkable woman, and I have her to thank for being so tough and brave over this. And it has helped me for all my life. Were there restrictions on your social life while you were at Dorset House? You've mentioned drinking, sort of. D did diabetes affect other aspects of your social life? I did find that sometimes people, boyfriends, um, actually dropped me because I was diabetic. I was found this very hurt, hurting. Uh, one um, person I was particularly fond of, I kept it from him because this had happened to me before. And then directly he did know that was it. Um, I think people do find it a difficult thing to cope with, to feel they're taking on. They, um, they know it's a lifelong disease, that it uh, has to be reckoned with every day, every single day, and there are complications from it. And really, in a way, uh, if they're, um, unless they're, particularly fond of you, you're not really worth it. <laughs> Sorry. Before we move on to your marriage, could you just reflect on how much contact you had with medical pr practitioners up until you were 21, 22? Well, very little to do with GPs because I'm very seldom uh, ill. Um, just, you know, if I got sore throats or something like that. Um, but I did keep up very regularly with the diabetic clinic um, Where? in mainly at King's. Um, my mother would take me up there and because she felt that they were such a leading hospital in this. And um, in fact, later on, I went back to them when I particularly needed help. Um, the, when I was a student, I used to go to the Radcliffe in Oxford and um, regularly I was quite strict with myself about this. I hardly, I don't even remember seeing a GP in Oxford. Um, you know, you're, you're very fit really as a diabetic. There's no need to feel that you're ill. You, you actually have a very, very um, good diet, healthy diet, and you're encouraged to take exercise, which I did. I played a lot of tennis even after 
leaving school. And uh, that went on as long as I could. So um, really, the, one needed just the support on one's dose of, di uh, of insulin, how many injections to take a day, and on the results of blood sugars, which were pretty useless because that was only one every sort of three or four months, which didn't help very much. But one went on doing the urine test. By that time, there was something called clinitest. So you, you had a little test tube and you, you popped a, um, a tablet in and it used to boil up. So that was a little easier. Even so, it was quite an embarrassing thing to take around Can and you cope when with that it. Came in? No, I can't exactly. Um, but I think it must have been fairly early. And in fact, I still got a set upstairs somewhere, I think. Um, it was a very useful thing until the, the, um, being able to buy one's own blood sugar. Uh, um, um, instrument um, uh, came in which was only really about 20 years ago um, um, even then they were about 70 or 80 pounds now they're much cheaper and everyone has one but it, this is where diabetes has changed so radically where now it's so much easier to look after oneself moving on then from Spain mm -hmm. what happened after that after Spain I, I married what year? In 1958. And I went on working as an occupational therapist very happily. And then um, in 1961, my daughter was born. Now, this was a bit complicated. So I used to, I was working near London. And so I used to go back to King's College Hospital where um, Sir John Peel looked after me. He was particularly interested in diabetic babies. It was his special thing. And so I used to travel right from one side of London to, to the other to be checked up because I felt it was so important. My mother was then living in Nottinghamshire and her local nurse told her that she'd never known a diabetic's mother's baby to live. This horrified me and her. And Kings, though, told me that if I had three babies, I would probably have two alive. The stillbirth rate was still as high as that. But they kept very good control of my diabetes, helped me to do that. Through my pregnancy, I was quite well, but suddenly blew up with a lot of fluid. So they took me in at about six months uh, and kept me on complete bed rest until my daughter was born three weeks early um, by caesarean. And she was healthy from the beginning. And she, her weight was six and a half pounds. So um, this was excellent. I did have trouble um, with the wound. It took about three months to heal. But I did manage to to feed her. I was told I was one of the first diabetics I'd ever known to feed her baby. So uh, I, I believed in it very strongly and I managed to do it. I, I fed her for about three months. How did that affect you physically? Well, I needed a lot of extra um, carbohydrate, um, a great deal of well, I really doubled my dose of carbohydrates. and uh, But I managed to, to do it, and I think it gave her a very good start. And then um, everything settled down again, and um, uh, two years later um, uh, I had a son, and then unfortunately after that um, our marriage broke up. Before we move on to the next stage of your life, can you talk about how you monitored your own health over the first 30 years of your life? Well, monitoring your health with your diabetic is 
is just one simple thing, keeping your blood sugar uh, as normal as an ordinary person's. And to do that, the only way to measure it was through urine tests. Now, these are very impractical. I mean, when you're working full-time uh, as an occupational therapist or in hospital or wherever, um, even in a domiciliary way, yeah, it, it's difficult to get all the gear, to collect the sample, to do to do these things. So you tend not to do it. I, I didn't do it unless I was ill. And then I would regularly do it and get myself on the straight and narrow again. But it was really impossible to do it all the time. I mean, I, I didn't know another diabetic to ask whether they did it or not. But I did... Uh, I remember meeting a very little boy when I was once in King's and he, I told him how awful it was to having injections. So he was, do you think so, he said. And he said, oh, I just keep my, um, my, my gear in, in my pocket. And he got out a dirty hanky and there was his syringe. <laughs> so I started being a bit more relaxed about this. And actually, from the time I, um, I left school, I don't think I ever sterilized another needle or syringe. I used to keep it in a case. I didn't keep it in a hanky in my pocket. But I used to keep it in, in, in a case, in, um, well, actually in nothing, just in the case. Um, and I don't think I, I might have boiled up a new, a new one. But after that, it only touched me, it only went into me, and I never had an abscess in my life from it. So from that point of view, it was very easy to control the diabetes. But from knowing what your blood sugar was, this was impossible until the time of being able to um, monitor our own blood sugars, which was really only about 20 years ago. And that has transformed, must have transformed the whole business of being a diabetic. There was no way of doing this before unless you went um, to the surgery every day and had it done, or you were in hospital where, of course, it could be done. Um, but it was hit and miss. It really was. And if you were a fairly brittle diabetic, as I am, um, your blood sugars obviously went up and down. You had to more or less control it by how you felt. I could feel, I can feel, I always know when my blood sugar's falling, and uh, when you're burning up more sugar than others. And so you had to rely on, on this enormously. Will you talk about any complications that you had? Yes, the first complication I had was when um, we were all fam... Um, the whole family was camping. And I woke up one morning with a black dot in my eye. And this spread over the eye it was right inside and I went to the uh, um, local optician and he said I'm afraid you've had a hemorrhage took me straight to the hospital he was excellent and this was a vitreous hemorrhage which was a great shock and in those days there was no uh, laser treatment to stop the bleeding or to prevent the um, deterioration of the eye and stop new vessels from bursting. So um, from then onwards, from 19... This was after I'd had diabetes for 20... for 28 years. And I was then confronted with the fact that I, I had to be very careful of my eyesight and couldn't bend and lift anything heavy, I'd do any strenuous work in that way and um, had to be careful even picking up the children to use my knees in other words. You say it was Straight a shock, back. had you had no warning that your eyesight might be affected? No, I mean I had knowledge that um, people's eyesights but I, I had shown no trouble there were, they saw no aneurysms in the back of my eye. I went for, uh, every time I went to the clinic, my eyes were looked at. It was all very thorough, excellent 
treatment. Um, and then this suddenly happened. And um, it wasn't until um, quite a few years later that um, I had my first treatment on the eye, which they did with a light coagulator, which was a very, very... Um, unsympathetic machine. I mean, it wasn't exact like a laser. I mean, they saw you got bursts of sort of light into the eye and it was all a bit hit and miss. But that's the only thing they could do at the time. And I've had very many laser treatments since, since, um, since that day. Unfortunately, I have now lost the sight of one eye. But the other eye um, has had laser treatment and it is still keeping going, and I'm still working now as an artist. In the late 1960s, my first marriage broke up, and I was left alone with two young children, aged three and five, to bring up on my own. Um, couldn't manage this and do occupational therapy. By that time, anyway, I was working in a children's hospital and the work was too heavy for me because the children I was treating there were usually um, unable to move on their own, had to be lifted, and I had to do a lot of work on the ground with them, giving them exercises and balance and so on. So that work was very unsuitable for me, um, and I would get regularly get um, vitreous hemorrhages, and the doctors advised me to give it up and go and live quietly in the country. Uh, this was a great disappointment, but luckily um, I had another career going at the same time, which was being an artist. So I was able to um, totally rely on that, and I managed to buy a cottage in the country and live quietly in a very, very good village where there was a lot of support fairly near Oxford, so there again I had enormous support from the diabetic clinic there, which has helped me since 1969. The, the children, this was a great responsibility because I was the only one um, looking after them day and night. Uh, and so I think I possibly made sure I didn't go hypo um, too often and didn't keep my blood sugar as low as I could have done because <clears throat> there was no one to look after me and they were far too young to worry about anything like that. The, um, we had a very happy time in Bampton and the complications that... Um, I had um, medically were rarely um, due to my eyesight, nearly or n nearly entirely. Now, <clears throat> this, these were still the days before uh, laser, good laser treatment came in. So, if I had a hemorrhage, I used to lie down for a week and completely rest, and it would clear. And time after time after time, this happened. And the children got used to it, and they were very good. And I get extra people in to help me from, the, you know, and so on. And the village all supported me, and the doctors. And occasionally, I'd have to go into the eye hospital, and have various things done. I suppose then the laser treatment came in. So, um, and then eventually, um, I. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I have to take that bit out. <laughs> and eventually I had a cataract removed off my good eye. So now I can see well enough to still paint and still earn my living by painting. By the time the children were almost off my hands, I, I married for the second time. With this marriage, I've had absolutely wonderful support and understanding. And... I wouldn't be alive to this day without without this, I know, because it is the older you get, 
the more complicated diabetes becomes, the more you need moral support. It's an, as you get, when you're young, you take it in your stride. It's easy. You, you can make yourself almost invisible as far as it's concerned to other people. But when you get older, you get complications which can't be hidden. They're depressing. You, um, find yourself older than you are, um, physically but not mentally. So mentally, you rather crumble, I think. It's, it's very depressing. Um, you need a lot of support on this side, a lot of um, support to keep you busy, to keep you occupied, to keep, keep you focused, and away from seeing the awful things that can happen to you. Um, in the latest stages of diabetes and in this I've been extremely lucky and I've had someone to do exactly this and also from the diabetic um, clinic point of view absolutely wonderful help and support from everyone in Oxford I have not one anything to grumble about there I've had nothing, nothing, nothing but support. And now, even nowadays, you, you get your own nurse you can phone up if you need to. Now, this never happened in the old days. But if you're worried about anything, um, you can always phone your particular nurse, which must be a wonderful thing for new diabetics. Well, the diabetic department there... Um, covers you on all the other things that start going wrong when you get old. The, um, I'm coming on really to thing, ordinary things that happen in life. Other, th other illnesses, because they're not always related to diabetes. For instance, I broke my ankle in Greece um, in 1987. It was beautifully put into a plaster there, and it healed. I came back after a fortnight, and it healed beautifully after about eight, eight weeks, uh, ten weeks. Well, then disaster. Um, three years later, I broke my ankle in England. Can I go on about this? And the, um, I was put into plaster very beautifully at the, at, um, John Radcliffe. And then I was meant to be in plaster for 14 weeks. Um, it had to be removed and look, my skin looked at very often because, um, you very easily get ulcers, especially if you have no feeling in your feet. I lost the feeling in my feet. Um, in about 1985, and from about ankle sock height, I, I, um, I can't, I, ankle sock downwards rather, I can't feel. Now, um, when my foot was, um, when my ankle was plastered right up to the knee, um, two of the time, times the plaster was put on too loosely, and I got very, very bad ulcers, which took about four months to clear up. But when one specialist did it, and he took it on in the end to change it every fortnight for me, he was the only person who could put it on tightly enough so that it wouldn't rub, and I never got an ulcer with him. Unfortunately, I went for a checkup one week when he was away, and the consultant um, told me, this was after six weeks, he told me, the x-ray looked good, my ankle could come out of plaster. My husband and I and the person in the plaster room begged him not to do that. We, I told him I was diabetic. I'm not sure if he had my notes there in front of him lost, because they got lost five times. And he refused to put another plaster on. He put an, a removable plaster on and told the physio to give me exercises. I knew this was wrong, didn't do the exercises, but I didn't have enough support for my foot 
got myself back to see the other consultant a week later and found that my the three bones in my ankle had moved and they have never mended since then. I'm now confined to wearing a, a special boot to be able to take my weight at all. I can't put my foot down at all, take my weight without this special boot. Now, this is the only thing that has gone so disastrously wrong with me in all these years, so perhaps I'm lucky. But to find a consultant who wouldn't, wouldn't, take, wouldn't listen to me on something I knew about, I knew it had to be in plaster for 14 weeks because the other consultant told me that this. It, is, it absolutely horrifies me. I wouldn't dream of doing anything about it. I suppose I could sue him, but I wouldn't dream of doing this. I've had far too much good treatment over my diabetes to ever do it, and I just feel this is my cross in life, perhaps. And um, But it is uh, making many complications in my life, in, in, in our life, and I'm very, very sad about it, and I hope these things, these sort of things, won't happen in future. And the, the patient um, themselves very often knows far more than the doctor and can knows what's bad for them. And I just wish people would listen to them sometimes because this is ha absolutely has been disastrous. I've had to put a stair lift in at home. Uh, I can't walk very far at all. I have to, I've bought myself one of these electric scooters to be able to get around. Um, I can walk without a stick. Um, and um, How often do you need to see any medical practitioners? Very often. I have to, I'm under constant surveillance at the Nuffield. I'm allowed to phone up and say, please, will you see me? Because my ankle could completely collapse any time. And I don't know um, what quite what would happen. Um, and the at the moment, I'm suffering from um, a septic toe because I didn't feel it rubbing in my boot, and I've now got an ulcer on the end of my toe, and it's 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 proving very very difficult to heal. The diabetic clinic is being wonderful, seeing me three times a week. See these accidents makes so much more work. I mean, I, I, I must have, I must have cost the health service a fortune over this just because someone wouldn't listen to me and be told that my f foot shouldn't have come out of plaster. Have you had chiropathy? Chiropathy a lot. Um, these days you can't get it as easily as you could. You have to travel further to get it. We used to be able to get it in, in our local uh, doctor surgery, um, but now um, that can't happen. So I get a chiropodist to come to the house uh, um, to do it here. For one thing, there's less likelihood of infection, and uh, I get it done once a, once a month and I pay for it because I think it's very important. Diabetics have to look after their feet. How's that? The, um, the, the damage to my ankle has resulted in the fact that I haven't been able to take enough exercise and my uh, I've had trouble with my heart because of it, I think, um, though it's probably coming anyway, and I've had to have an angioplasty done in, 19, in 2000. And, and this year I've um, have had a laminectomy because... Um, obviously I'm walking in a strange way and this affected my back um, this this one mistake just because a consultant wouldn't listen to me has really caused all these problems I think it's so important that people listen to diabetics they've lived they live with their disease day in day out and they know very well how to look after it. Um, in the past, um, when I've been in hospital, right up to about 10 years ago, um, the, 
um, whichever ward you're in has looked after your insulin. You've had no say in it, really. And the, and the um, medic or uh, medic on duty has to uh, authorize your insulin every time. Um, this, in the past, has led to problems with me. Um, for instance, when I was in the eye hospital having an eye operation, I couldn't check my own insulin, and I was given the, um, the wrong dose. By lunchtime, I knew this. The French doctor that was on said, quick, give her give her sugar, give her glucose, and I had to say, no, I refuse to take glucose. I'm going the other way. And I insisted on having a blood sugar test done first, and they they did it and found I, in fact, wasn't hypo. I was very high. My blood sugar had gone up to over 20. And um, I said, well, what? how much insulin was I given this morning? Well, I was given a quarter of my days. So this is what happened. Now, if I hadn't understood how I felt, I'd been given more sugar and got into quite a state. Well, nowadays, they're very good. Even when I had my laminectomy, although I was um, under drugs for the pain afterwards, I managed to look after my own diabetes. Once or twice they had to help me with the injections. Um, but this, I think, um, I suppose you can't do it with every patient. You've got to understand what you're doing. And I do regulate my own dose almost daily, depending on what I've rather... Um, I started doing this rather off my own bat. But I believe now that more people do it. I, I found that it was easier to change my insulin if I was going to have a lot of exercise and I was low anyway in blood sugar rather than eating too much, having to eat too much sugar and get fat and or fatter. And um, so I have used a, a sort of mini sliding scale um, in my own right. Now I, I'm, I think it's quite approved of now, and so so um, this makes life a lot easier. Of course, this is quite difficult in hospital, and I don't think the nursing staff like it very much. <laughs> but um, as long as I know it's going to work for me, I'm afraid I'd rather insist on doing it. Have you noticed any changes in attitudes on the parts of doctors and nurses to diabetes over the time you've had it? Yes, they're very much more flexible to the patient now. They will listen to how you are because I would think that every diabetic's different. I, I should think it's an extremely difficult thing to control exactly. There must be um, ways of doing it uh, on dosage of insulin at times, like especially when you're being anaesthetized and so on. Um, but day to day, there's so many things that affect your diabetes. When I was last talking to the medical students in Oxford, um, Dr. Matthews asked them for 20 reasons for going hypo, and they just managed it, which I thought was extremely clever. And I'm sure um, that wouldn't have happened a few years ago. There's a lot more awareness. Everyone is becoming more aware, but it's still rather uh, an un, um, an unhappy disease in a way. No one really wants to face the fact that it even happened to them. It's happening to more and more people um, with the lifestyles we lead, and people, I think, are afraid of it. It's not a very fashionable or if you can call illness, is that. But I do think it's a very dangerous one. Have you noticed any changes in attitudes on the behalf of, on the part of lay people? Yes, everyone's much more aware of it now. And they, they're starting to realise that there are two types and um, ask more questions. And, of course, things are a lot easier than they used to be because you can get diet drinks, you can get 
Um, everyone's very much more fair, aware of their diets now. And also on packaging, you can usually tell the carbohydrate value of things and so on, which you, you couldn't in the past. So in so many ways it's easier because there's nothing like that. You couldn't get any low-calorie drinks. You drank water or nothing, which is very difficult socially, really. Um, you couldn't even get a diet, you know, tonic water <laughs> and pretend you were having a gin and tonic. <laughs> uh, it used to be quite difficult. Um, things are a lot easier, and so they should be. It's not a nice, really, a very pleasant disease to have because, you know, it's like, right, it's really, I was asking a friend the other day how he felt about it. He developed it about 15 years ago. Uh, and he said, it's like, right, it's like walking a tightrope. He has type um, A diabetes as me, or type 1, whatever you say. And he is on insulin and he has managed to keep uh, working all right but he said it's like walking a tightrope with a drop either side of you of 800 feet and i suppose it is that's a very good description really you've just got to keep yourself on that straight and narrow and understand how to keep yourself there and if you topple over too far you're going to go down has diabetes really determined the course of your life? No, not at all. No, I've done everything I wanted to do. I've had a wonderful life. I have rarely have done all I want to do. And still working now at 66 and still putting on exhibitions of, well, my husband is also, also an artist and this year we've put on a show with a hundred pictures. They've all had to be painted. In fact, we've we've um, we've been to France. We've been to Greece. We've been um, well. In the past, we've been a lot to Venice. I've walked all over Venice. Now I can't do that with this ankle. Um, but all over the country, painting. We work almost full time. So um, it keeps you, I think, since we've been together, he's been healthier because he keeps to my diet, which, of course, is no puddings. <laughs> and uh, a very, very healthy diet, with lots of vegetables, and, you know, it's a, very, it's a good diet. It's, it, in, from that point of view, that's very much a plus side. Um, it, he, he's extremely intelligent and takes it in his stride. And... It doesn't phase him at all. And in that way, I'm so lucky. Um, but I can see how it could really up phase people and upset people's um, marriages, as it really did mine, my first one. And it, this is a this is a tricky point for it. Mm. When you're telling people about yourself, is is do you say I'm a diabetic? Is no. No, I don't. I I still don't. I don't think it's the important part in life. Nowadays, you can say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't eat this. I mean, lots of people don't eat things because they don't like them now and because they're slimming or something like that. Um, people happen to know because of, you know, the sort of health, health things that have happened. So, oh, no, I never tell people unless, um, unless it, it's, it's obvious I need some help. And if I'm traveling, I do get help at the airport. And I don't tell them on um, on the plane because you don't get a very good diet. You don't get a very good meal if you di get a diabetic one. It's um, It doesn't suit me at all. It's much too heavy. Um, but also, oh, a very funny thing happened to me once. I um, I did tell someone I was diabetic. Because she said to me, someone I didn't know at all, really, very well, uh, asked me to dinner. And I said, she said, can you eat anything? I said, well, I, I happen to be diabetic. Oh, dear. She said, oh, that's all right. I know exactly what to do. So when I went to dinner, I found there was no carbohydrate at all. And I was slowly going hypo through dinner because I'd had my <laughs> insulin before dinner. 
And I had to sort of creep out and take my bag with me and eat all my glucose in my bag <laughs> to stop going hypo. Uh, these things can happen. So I, th I just shut up about it and, you know, on the whole and just, just manage. Hmm. You've talked a lot about just knowing how you were going to be, feeling hmm. how you were going to be. And you amazed me earlier by talking about the hospital giving you a deliberate hypo. Can you just elaborate on that a bit? Well, yes, you see, if you're a little girl of nine and you've never had anything like a hypo, it would be quite uh, scary, I think, to suddenly feel weak, hot and sweaty, shaky, terribly hungry. And you might not be near an adult you could explain this to. Well, I was told how I would feel if, um, as they, the, they said, I'm, we're going to give you some medicine which will make you feel like this. Now, when you feel like this, you tell us and we'll put it right. But we're t giving you this so that you know that when you feel like this, you must have some glucose or a sweet drink or a bis biscuit or two or even a drink of milk. And this, well, this has t stood me in good stead all my life. Uh, I always have good warnings, uh, if, well, until lately, um, the, if I was getting hypo. And I really bless the day that doc that doctor did that for me. Um, after I'd had diabetes for 50 years, I was sent a wonderful medal from the Diabetic Association. I thought this was wonderful. It was a great morale boost. And when I've had it for 60 years, which is in four years' time, I'll get another medal. I think this is marvellous. The Diabetic Association does this. And if you belong to it, you get a magazine every three months. And it, nowadays, it's extremely helpful. They tell you a lot of medical details that you were always hidden from before. It wasn't good for one to know things. Uh, I used to get to know them because I asked questions. But I think now people are allowed to know what's wrong with them and how to cope with it and, and so on. And this magazine is it's called balance and it's extremely good from the diabetic um, association do you feel that in the past medical staff hid things from you because it wasn't oh good? yes oh yes i mean you were sort of protected you see and you weren't supposed to be told too much i suppose i think it was a protection in a way because there was a time when i didn't want to know all the nasty things that could happen to me. There was a time when I was young when I used to go to the diabetic clinic and feel quite depressed for a few days afterwards because there were all these old people, usually in wheelchairs, with uh, who'd lost legs and so on, who were blind, white sticks, no legs or something like this. And I thought, my goodness, this is what I'm in for. Now, there is, this, of course, is an ongoing thing, and this can't be helped. So it is a problem, but I do think people need a bit of warning, in a way. I don't know how you do it. I'm not an expert in that line. But having been an, an OT and done quite a lot of psychology and worked in mental hospitals, and also with children and with adults, as a whole, I can see that through the different stages in your life, you've got to be protected in different ways. And I think diabetic consultants um, have a great responsibility in this because if you're frightened by it, you, 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 you could blot it out. And I think these days when everyone, one particular thing must be extremely difficult Everyone's got to be so terribly thin. So, I mean, when I was a teenager, well, I was fairly slim because I was still slim from first being diabetic. Then I started putting on weight. Um, and um, I think it, I 
would now have been trying to slim so hard that it could have affected my diabetes. I have heard of people who have actually stopped giving themselves their insulin um, so that they don't have to eat. And this is such a dangerous thing that, I mean, I wouldn't have considered doing it. Um, but I think, in a way, um, it must... Must this sort of thing has has got to be stopped in a way through psychological means because it's a very very deep. I mean, it must be frightfully difficult getting people to eat certain diets anyway nowadays. Uh, we're with this obsession to be as thin as a bean stick. Um, so um, I don't know what else to say really. Well, when do you feel that medical staff began to be more open with you and tell you whatever you needed to know? Well, I think it's probably over the last 10 years or so that um, this change has happened when we're given more knowledge. Of course, the prob great problem is time, because there isn't a lot of time to talk to your consultant when you go to the clinic uh, they you know I think they're probably given 10 minutes for you and that's it and so you know you um, you don't get a lot of time to discuss it and there's a great deal to discuss when you go I don't know I think mm, staff I mean cons consultants they I don't know how they manage getting so much over in a short time because it affects your life so much, um, so completely. Um, if you go off the rails, then what do you do? If you don't, or if you're stuck in a place, supposing you're stuck in a traffic jam uh, with no food in the car, <clears throat> whatever do you do then? It, these things must be told to people. They must never go anywhere without packet of biscuits or something near them so there's so much to tell them I don't know how they cope I really don't actually Can't. I'm getting a bit chatty now have you reflected on why you have diabetes I've often wondered why it should be me out of a vast family I have well about 40 or so cousins no one else has it I believe a great aunt had it in India um, but I should imagine it was in, uh, it was type B because she was it was in her old age and she couldn't have lived because this was the pre-insulin date so um, all I can think of is that it was the shock of coming back to England really it could have started uh, with, by the, from the death of my father when I was five because we were very close. Um, when I thought of having children, um, I debated very, thought very strongly about it, but as it wasn't strong in my family, I felt that it was a risk worth taking. Um, and so far, so good. I have seven grandchildren, and everyone so far, touch wood, very healthy. <laughs>